It is now time for oral questions. And I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question for the Premier. According to Dr. Michael Warner, the OR at Michael Guerin Hospital in Toronto drops are using just two out of ten operating rooms at 4 p.m. That's eight operating rooms sitting empty for more than 12 hours per day. Why is the government choosing to send surgeons, nurses, and funding to private for-profit clinics while operating rooms in our hospitals sit idle? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for giving me an opportunity to highlight the announcement that we made with the Minister of Long-Term Care on the weekend. I'm sorry, on Thursday, it's a plan to stay open, health care, stability, and resistance. A five-point plan that talks about not only health care human resources, but giving hospitals the additional investments that they need to make sure that when there are hot, um, suites, operating suites available, we are, we are funding them additionally. We are doing programs that allow our paramedics to go into community and serve people in community. In, in my own community uh, on the weekend, I was approached by someone who said they've been using the community paramedicine program for years and they love it. It is exactly what they need to be able to stay safely at home. The Five Point Plan covers a number of areas that we know we can Bonds. focus better on and ensure that we have the health care services we need where we need them. Thank you. The supplementary question. Again to the Premier, in December 2021, Ontario's Auditor General reported that ORs sit unused far more than they should. A full third of hospitals in Ontario didn't even hit the target for operating room use. And the same goes for CT and MRIs. CT scanners are used at 37 percent, while MRI machines are used at 56 percent of system capacity. St. Joe's and Sick Kids in Toronto. Lake Ridge Health Hospitals in Oshawa and Ajax and North Bay Regional Health Centre all shut down their CT and MRI machines by 4 p.m. Why is this government refusing to use the operating room CT and MRI capacity we already have? So, Speaker, as I mentioned, we've already invested $300 million as part of our province's surgical recovery strategy. And I only point to the Ontario Hospital Association's comments after the Thursday announcement. The OHA supports the strategy announced today by the Government of Ontario for the fall and winter 2022-23, as it will help maintain access to health services during what is expected to be a challenging period. It is essential that all partners continue to work closely together as a team of Ontario approach to overcome the complex underlying issues facing the health care system. Hospitals are here to serve the people of Ontario and will continue to do everything possible to meet their health services needs. We will continue those partnerships. Thank you, Speaker. The final supplementary. Moving surgeries and procedures to private for-profit clinics will send surgeons, nurses, technicians, and other health care workers out of our hospitals. Why is the Premier robbing from the underused public system to send health care workers and funds to private for-profit clinics? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. I will remind the member opposite and all parliamentarians here that we have actually added 400 physicians, residents, to support the workforce in northern and rural Ontario. Order. We're launching a new provincial emergency department peer-to-peer -peer program to provide additional on-demand, real-time support and coaching from experienced Member for Kitchener, Conestoga, come to order. And the member for Hamilton Mountain, come to order. The Minister of Health can continue. Thank you, Speaker. And from the Ontario Medical Association, they support the initiatives announced today by the government, strengthening collaboration with government, doctors, and other health care stakeholders is critical to resolving the unprecedented pressures on Ontario's health care system. No one group can do this alone. We must work together. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question. Member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last week, we got to see the Conservatives' long-term care plan. Cruel doesn't even begin to describe it. Hospital discharge planners have always been allowed to have conversations with patients. However, the new regulations give them power to access a patient without consent. 
to send their personal information to a private care home without their consent, to discharge them from the hospital and admit them into a long-term care facility without their consent. Informed consent is the cornerstone of modern medicine and health care. My question is clear. How on earth did the Premier come up with this cruel scheme instead of just properly resourcing our long-term care system? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, the, the honourable gentleman is actually incorrect. Uh, now, he, perhaps he didn't have a chance to uh, to take a look at the bill, Mr. Speaker, because had he looked at the bill, he would have seen right in the explanatory note that, in fact, uh, consent will still be required. If he went a little bit further into Bill 60, uh, uh, subsection 60. Uh, dash seven, he would see again that consent is still required, Mr. Speaker. What we're doing actually is uh, is working with our acute care partners to finally be able to be in a position to address the challenges that have faced acute care for a very, very long time in this province, Mr. Speaker. Long-term care is in a position to be part of that solution, and it's in that position ultimately because of the investments that this government has made since coming to office in 2018. Mr. Again, Mr. Speaker, the, the honourable gentleman is wrong. I'd be more than happy to uh, to send a copy of the bill over to him so that he can uh, take a look at it for himself. The supplementary question. I certainly do uh, appreciate the uh, minister's uh, sending over the bill to me, but I just happen to have a copy in front of me. The new provisions authorize certain actions to be carried out without the consent of these patients. It's right in the bill. So maybe I'll give it to the clerk and maybe. Uh, they can send it over to you. To Speaker, this bill seeks to send seniors out of their communities to homes with open beds. You know which homes are most likely to have open beds? They are private, for-profit, long-term care homes with terrible records of abuse and no air conditioning in their rooms. We have 79 care homes that have no air con condition as of this weekend. Order. The same private care homes with PC insiders on their boards. How can this government even pretend to care about seniors when they're literally proposing to rip them away from their families? Speaker. Will the Premier accept the responsibility when seniors deteriorate under this scheme and get abused like they have been for a couple years now in these facilities? Thank you. Minister of Long-Term Care. Again, Mr. Speaker, uh, the, the Honourable Gentleman is wrong. I'll quote directly from the bill. Uh, uh, ALC patient to a long transfers uh, of an ALC patient to a long-term care home uh, w without the consent of the LC patient or their substitute decision makers will not be allowed. So, Mr. Speaker, it is very clear that that uh, will not be allowed. But the member's tune has changed a little bit since Thursday, right? Because Thursday, colleagues, he was saying that people would be forcibly removed from hospital against their will without their consent. He said that they would be moved into ward rooms uh, across the province and hundreds of miles away from their family and friends, Mr. Speaker. Now, because of the investments that we have made in long-term care, that is not going to happen, and the member knows this. He knows that we will not move people without their consent, but it allows us to have a conversation. What homes might be available to a, a patient in, in, in a hospital who has been discharged in and around their homes of choice while they wait Response. for their home of choice to become available, Mr. Speaker. I think that's responsible. It is part of the solution to the acute care challenge we face for, de uh, for, for decades, and I'm happy that long-term care can play a role. And the final supplementary. Thank you very much. And let's be clear, conversation is not consent. 5,000 seniors have died in long-term care homes over the last couple of years. 40 of them died last week. Parents, grandparents, mother-in-laws, father-in-laws, under this government's watch, we have seniors waiting in hospitals because there are no long-term beds in their own communities. We have seniors roasting in long-term care homes that are over 40 degrees because there's no air conditioning in their rooms. Now the government's own legislation says seniors will be sent to homes outside their community without consent. When will this government admit they completely failed on this file and left seniors behind? Speaker, taking care of seniors shouldn't be a part-time job. When will the Premier appoint a full-time Minister of Long-Term Care? Seniors deserve no less. Thank you. Minister of Long-Term Care. Speaker, I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's not dangerous that the Honourable Gentleman is wrong, because I can only assume that he hasn't read the bill and he's not up to speed. But what is dangerous is to be out there communicating things that just simply are not part of the legislation. 
Nobody will be removed from a discharge who is discharged from a hospital will be moved into a long-term care home without their consent. It's in the explanatory note, and it's actually in the legislation itself, Mr. Speaker. There is nobody roasting in long-term care homes at 40 degrees. The Fixing Long-Term Care Act, which he voted against, ensures that that does not happen. In fact, almost 89 percent of our homes have air conditioning in each and every room, and one 100% of our long-term care homes are air-conditioned, Mr. Speaker. That is the reality. But here is the thing, Mr. Speaker. Long-term care, we can be part of the solution, Mr. Speaker. It has been decades that long-term care has placed a challenge on the acute care system, but because of the investments that we have made, that they have voted against, we can be part of the solution, Mr. Speaker, and we will be. The next question, the member for Davenport. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Minister of Education. Speaker, unfortunately, our public health care system isn't the only sector that's being targeted for privatization by this government. Two weeks ago, the finance minister announced a new scheme uh, that would give payouts to parents for tutoring outside of school. It's a plan that sucks $225 million out of our public schools, far surpassing whatever this government is contributing to in-school supports for kids, and giving them what I can only guess is about 50 bucks per family uh, for, uh, for tutoring services outside of school. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Education, how does taking money away from our in-school supports and public education and forcing families to find help for their kids at 50 bucks a year actually help our struggling students? To reply, the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we reject the premise it's an either-or proposition. This progressive Conservative government is going to give support to parents while increasing investments in public education. We can do both in this province, and we owe it to parents to do both. And, you know, it's so critical at a time of rising national inflation, the cost of living challenge. I find it a bit bizarre for New Democrats and Liberals to oppose measures, even if they incrementally provide 50, 100, 200, 400 dollars, as we've done in the past year over the pandemic. That makes a difference, and parents of this province want more of it, not less. We're going to increase investments for public education, as announced by the Minister of Finance, by 650 million more dollars for this September. A learning recovery plan that leads the nation with $175 million in tutoring support for the publicly funded schools the member opposite rightfully speaks about. We agree it is important these kids get back on track. And, Mr. Speaker, the most important thing we can do, in addition Bonds? to the dollars, is to have a resolute commitment to keeping kids in class, and our government will deliver that for the kids at this point. Supplementary question. Speaker. It's clear this is really about sucking funds out of publicly funded education and subsidizing private tutoring at $50 Order. a family a year. Order. What does that actually Order. achieve? If anybody, Speaker, was watching the Jays game Order. last week, you probably saw these slick new taxpayer-funded ads for the government's so-called plan to catch up. And let's be clear that most of that is a recap of funding that was announced last year and this new $50 tutoring support. Who, how, when, or who's going to get those support checks? Because the government hasn't even released any details of it. So not only are they prioritizing these one-off checks over real investment in our kids' schools, but they're spending massively to convince parents that they're doing more than they are. Speaker, how much is the government spending on this massive advertising program to promote a plan that doesn't even exist yet? Minister of Education. You know, Mr. Speaker, it's not lost on families watching that when the details were unveiled for the $200 investment we provide to every child, or the $400 when we doubled it, the New Democrats opposed it then, just like they will do it now. They have stood up against the incremental savings our government has been able to provide for families. Order. And it ideologically is consistent. After Order. all, in the child care deal, where we're now saving on average $4,000 this year, $12,000 by next year, wow. the New Democrats wanted us to omit for profit child care because they don't believe in choice, they don't believe in respecting parents, Member and they don't Davenport, believe come in delivering affordability for the taxpayers of this province. Our government and our premier have a mandate to do that, to work with our publicly funded school boards to improve education quality, to invest more and to expect more. And that's exactly what we're going to do by investing in a landmark tutoring expansion plan, a 420 percent increase in mental health. Response. All of this is going to make a difference as we get kids in normal, stable, more enjoyable schools this September, Speaker. Next question, 
The member for Whitby. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Long-Term Care. Last Thursday, the minister introduced legislation in this House that critics have suggested will see seniors discharged from hospital and moved into long-term care homes in communities far from their family and friends and against their will. We all know, Speaker, how difficult it was during the initial waves of COVID-19 when family could not visit or participate in caring for their loved one in a long-term care home. Speaker, is the minister doing, as critics have suggested, and ignoring the lessons of the pandemic and forcing seniors to live alone, isolated from family? Minister of Long-Term Care. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the member uh, for Whitby for the uh, for the question and uh, and the obvious passion which he brings to the file. I can assure the member that, uh, of course, no such action will be taken. Uh, consent will still be required. Ultimately, Mr. Speaker, we do understand how important it is that uh, loved ones. Uh, family, friends, spouses, partners are close to their to their loved ones in long-term care. Not only because they they provide uh, 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 assistance with day-to-day day-to-day uh, uh, -day activities, Mr. Speaker, but because of the emotional support that comes with having a loved one uh, uh, nearby. But it also reflects, Mr. Speaker, that the best care for somebody who has been discharged from a hospital is not in a hospital. It is in a long-term care uh, uh, home, Mr. Speaker. As the parliamentary assistant. Uh, uh, said we want to turn people from patients to residents, Mr. Speaker. We are in, uh, we have the ability to do so, and I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that long-term care can be part of the solution. Supplementary question. But back to the Minister of Long-Term Care, Speaker. I appreciate the answer. However, regulation will be used to implement the legislation, and how, and, and will identify the parameters around movement into a home. Very specifically, Speaker, who will the minister be consulting in advance of establishing the regulation? And how long will Ontario families wait before the minister delivers the regulations implementing the legislation? Mr. Long Term Care. Again, uh, thank, uh, thank the Honourable uh, uh, Member for, uh, for the very important question. Uh, uh, my parliamentary assistant, uh, Mr. Jordan, will be undertaking, has already begun undertaking uh, consultations. We'll be working with uh, uh, residents, councils, uh, family, uh, uh, clinicians, uh, hospitals, Mr. Speaker, and residents to ensure that, uh, that the regulations, uh, in fact, keep residents as close uh, to their, uh, their homes of choice as possible and close to their family, friends, and spouses. But specific to uh, the question, Speaker, assuming that this legislature uh, passes, uh, uh, passes this bill, we will quickly present regulations no later than one week following the passage of the bill. Thank you. Next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Premier. One year ago this week, downtown Wheatley exploded, likely as a result of an old abandoned gas well that had leaked. According to the Globe and Mail, months after the explosion, the Chatham-Kent Fire Chief warned the provincial government of gas leaks and repeatedly begged for help. But the province evidently decided this was the municipality's problem, not the province's. There are an estimated 15,000 abandoned oil and gas wells in rural southwestern Ontario. Experts say another Wheatley is just a matter of time. Will the provincial government take action to prevent another explosion, or will the Premier abandon rural communities to deal with this danger on their own? Government House Leader. Again, uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Speaker. And first and foremost, let me just uh, uh, thank the uh, uh, the new member from uh, Chatham Kent for the uh, the work that he's been doing on this uh, on this file, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it is something that uh, it is something that he addressed uh, almost immediately after uh, after his uh, swearing in. Uh, at the same time, Mr. Speaker, significant resources have been put in place to ensure that we uh, identify and cap uh, and cap wells. Frankly, we are working with our, our partners at all levels, the municipal and the federal government, to not only identify these wells but to cap them. As I said, funding has been put in place uh, to ensure that uh, that that happens. At the same time, uh, through the good work of the member for uh, Chatham Kent and, of course, the, uh, the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, local businesses that were impacted by that uh, are, are being supported, Mr. Speaker. So more work needs to be done, but we're well on our way to ensuring all communities are safe. Supplementary, the member for Hamilton West and Castor Dundas. Premier, uh, the explosion in Wheatley flattened the downtown core and many people were hospitalized. 
About a year before the Wheatley explosion, there was another explosion just 10 kilometres away near Leamington. That explosion took the lives of a retired couple. Experts believe a leaky oil and gas well may have been the cause of that explosion as well. People have died. And yet, when Chatham Kent detected a gas leak in downtown Wheatley and begged the province for help, the province dithered. Past provincial governments have allowed oil and gas companies to walk away from their responsibilities when they abandon these wells. When will your government take action to prevent another deadly explosion that we are seeing in the province of Ontario? Uh, thanks, Speaker. Uh, the government is keenly aware of the, the problems with the homeowners and tenants in Wheatley. Obviously, we were on the ground very early, both the Premier uh, and Minister Rickford. Um, on March 4, 2022, the province extended uh, the Wheatley Residence Assistance Program uh, to the end of uh, the year. Wheatley residents who have not been able to return home can receive assistance uh, costs until December uh, 31, 2022. So far, Speaker, uh, the Honourable Member should know that we paid over $823,000 to help evacuated households, and additional payments are being made on an ongoing basis. The next question, the member for Oakville North Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, in an answer to one of my colleagues earlier in question period, the Minister of Long-Term Care confirmed that no patient in hospital will be discharged into a long-term care home against their will and that he understands the importance of keeping someone in long-term care close to family and friends. However, the opposition are suggesting that, as part of the solution to the decades-long challenges in acute care, seniors are being forced back into four-bed ward rooms. Speaker, these ward rooms were singled out by the Long-Term Care Commission as being a serious part of the problem in the initial waves of COVID-19. Can the minister confirm if he is considering this as part of the solution, and if so, what evidence does he have that they are now safer? Minister of Long-Term Care. Uh, thank, you, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for uh, the question. Of course, the, the member served as a parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Long-Term Care, uh, predating me, and uh, did a tremendous amount of work, which actually has brought us to the position where we can actually participate in long-term care. So I thank her for, for that work and the passion that she brings. But, uh, very, very specific uh, to her question. Despite, despite what uh, the opposition critic is tweeting out and, and press releases, uh, uh, four-bedroom ward rooms will not be used as part of this solution. Thank you. A supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Minister. And, Speaker, my follow-up to the Minister is about the resources that will be available to residents who are moving into a long-term care home following discharge from a hospital. Often, patients coming from hospital require some additional assistance that is not always available in a home. For example, patients requiring dialysis must move back and forth from home to hospital for their treatment. Residents with dementia would also need special services and care. The minister has stated that long-term care is able to be part of the solution. So can the minister explain what additional resources are provided to improve residents' quality of care? Minister of Long-Term Care. Uh, thank you again to, to the member, and I understand uh, uh, why she's asking this question because it is something that she worked on for uh, uh, four years uh, as the parliamentary assistant on the strategic long-term care advisory table. And what we are doing, Mr. Speaker, is we're adding $37 million in additional resources right now and over $60 million ongoing. And what this will do is, is to look at homes uh, and, and retrofit them. It's a community partnership that we're doing. So a patient discharged uh, from hospital who needs dialysis, we will make sure that the home where they may go to actually has dialysis available. But we're doing a bit more than that too. We're partnering up with Baycrest that offers uh, behavioral services, we're leading edge behavioral services. We're doing that and we're providing additional supports for Behavioral Services Ontario to deal with or to assist in, in, in those instances where, where a patient is leaving hospital with dementia and a, and a home requires additional 
additional uh, resources in order to deal with it. It is really, in all, in all honesty, thanks to the, uh, the hard work for the member for Oak for Philip Burlington and, of course, my predecessor, the, uh, the minister who, uh, who undertook a lot of this work in advance of me even getting there. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Meshkigawak, James Bay. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. With the rate of inflation, this program does not even cover the cost of gas, let alone, let alone a hotel room to travel for residents in Northern Ontario. Patients are left paying out of pocket for their expenses or racking up card, uh, credit card bills. Sadly, some people must cancel their appointment because they simply cannot afford it. What is this government going to do to help offset the costs of important medical travel and ease the financial burden for residents of Northern Ontario? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, we recognize that the residents in Northern Ontario face some unique challenges because of the distances between accessing health care, particularly specialty services. So the Northern Health Travel Grant is continuously upgrading quality improvement opportunities. In fact, in the 2021-22 allocation, it was $48.2 million. And most importantly for me, 96.2% of those applications were approved. We've done things like making sure that people who have to use the Northern Ontario Health Travel Grant have the opportunity, if they so choose, to be able to have direct deposits. So if you are using the service on a regular basis, you have the ability to receive that payment back sooner as opposed to waiting for a check. It is, it is an optional program, but I think it speaks to we always want to see where there are opportunities for improvement, and we will act as a government. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Encore au Premier ministre. Thank you. The reimbursement rate is 41 cents per kilometre. It has been for many years. With the price of gas sitting around $1.90 to $2 per litre, the hotel industry has seen an increased rate of up to 30 percent. It's not uncommon to pay $1.150 per night. The travel grant covers $100 for two nights. Meals have never included in the grant. These medical appointments are booked because they're necessary. How are seniors of low-income patients supposed to cover these costs? Will the government stop dragging their feet and implement a new revised reimbursement formula for this program? Thank you. The Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. So, as I mentioned in my previous answer, of course, we understand the unique challenges that northern and rural um, residents in Ontario experience, which is, frankly, why we have ensured that there are now 400 new additional uh, health care providers working in northern and rural Ontario. We'll continue to work with our partners to improve any programs that we have in place, and those in, those programs such as matching an emergency room doc with a, a peer mentor that may have uh, access to different um, skill sets and, and using that to make sure that we leverage so that people in Northern Ontario and across Ontario have equitable access to health care in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Question? The member for Ottawa. Mr. Speaker, climate change is wreaking havoc around the globe. Fires, windstorms, floods, all happening with ferocity and a frequency that we haven't seen before. Ottawa has seen two floods and three major windstorms in the last five years. That's once in a generation storms happening every single year, Mr. Speaker. But Ontario has failed to invest in infrastructure adaptation or the modernization of disaster relief programs to address the new reality. In May, the Direco, with winds up to 190 kilometers an hour, swept across the city. 180,000 residents were without power, some for days, many for weeks. Residents isolated at the upper, build, upper levels of apartment buildings without fresh water, Mr. Speaker. The emergency response to the storm has cost the city and Hydro Ottawa up to $50 million. Three months later, despite promises from the Premier, there has still been no provincial support to the city or Hydro Ottawa. When will the government step up, fulfill its commitments to the residents of Ottawa, and compensate the city and Hydro Ottawa for the cost of this storm? I apologize to the member. His riding, of course, is, Ottawa, is Orlane. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. 
Thank you, Speaker, and I, I thank the member opposite for his question and was pleased to join him with members uh, of Ottawa City Council to discuss climate change and the commitments that this government is, are taking to address and improve adaptation and resiliency uh, through the province's first ever climate change impact assessment. I know my colleague will address some specifics in the supplemental, but I'd like to lead by saying this is the first ever climate change impact assessment this province has ever undertaken. It was welcome news by the City of Ottawa and will help build our resiliency. Uh, to add to that, Speaker, we've made critical investments on stormwater, wastewater, infrastructure upgrades after years of neglect by the previous government, where we saw sewage spills leaching into Lake Ontario, where infrastructure was crumbling and not able to meet extreme weather events. Under this government, we've increased OSIF, a critical funding instrument for rural municipalities. We've increased funding for sewage and water, uh, sewage and water to address Spons. overflow issues. We've launched the first ever climate change impact assessment and will continue to work with municipal partners to address this. I'd like to thank the incredible staff at Hydro One uh, for the work that they've done uh, to address these, these outages. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question, the member for Orleans. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Supplemental to the Premier again. Uh, some of the hardest hit areas of Ottawa were in the rural areas. Navin, Sarsfield, Carlsbad Springs. Families like the McWilliams, the McFaddens, the Cottons have seen utter devastation to their farms and their properties. Farms that have been feeding the community in the region for generations. And they're not, they're not alone, Mr. Speaker. Des despite some nice promises from the Premier during the election, these families still don't qualify for the Disaster Recovery Assistance Program. Why? Because the government hasn't activated the program for the City of Ottawa, Mr. Speaker. These families have worked for generations, not only producing food, but giving back to the community. Whether it's leading the Navin Fair, which is vital to the village, whether it's volunteer firefighting, whether it's Hay West, these families have been contributing to their community, helping all of us for years, Mr. Speaker, during one of their darkest hours of need. When will this government step up and provide disaster relief to these Question. families? When will their government be there for them? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, well, Speaker, um, you know, ministry teams have been working with local officials since the uh, May 21st uh, storm event in the province. Uh, we deployed 19 provincial disaster assessment teams uh, to assess damage both in southern and eastern Ontario. People who were affected from the, from the storm, obviously uh, because the disaster relief assistance program for Ontarians isn't a replacement for insurance. We obviously uh, want to continue to encourage uh, residents to, uh, to meet with uh, their insurance company to talk about the assessment, and we'll continue to work with local officials. I, like uh, all members of this House, uh, celebrated the work that uh, our, uh, our hydro workers have done. We've got a tremendous amount of municipal staff and hydro staff that have been on the ground since that May 21st event. We applaud the work that they do, and we'll continue to work with our municipal workers. Next question. My question is oh, to the Minister of Law. The next question, the member for Cambridge. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question follows up on the previous two questions from my colleagues to the Minister of Long-Term Care. Why I appreciate that no senior will be discharged from the hospital into a home against their will, and no patient will be separated by great distance from family and friends, I am concerned about the resources being available. I'm not talking about additional funding that will be part of this, but more the availability of staff in homes that re receive a senior discharge from a hospital. Given the staffing challenge faced across the sector, how will the minister ensure that no senior discharge from a hospital becomes a resident of a home that is understaffed? Speaker, what exactly be the point of reducing stress in the acute care sector only to add it to long-term care sector and put residents at risk? Minister of Long-Term Care. Uh, thank, uh, thank uh, the member for uh, for the uh, the question. Uh, a very good question because we've heard some. Uh, uh, some discrepancies on how this will work, Mr. Speaker. One of the reasons why 
we need to be able to work with, uh, with families is so that we can assess what homes are available in in and around the, uh, the, the patient's preferred choice. Does the phone, as part of the fixing long-term care, does the home provide the resources that are needed? Does it require the extra resources? And does it have the staffing and the care available for a patient who might be discharged? That is what this act allows us to do that it didn't allow us to do. And again, as, as you know, Mr. Speaker, as part of the fixing long-term care act, nobody can be discharged into a home that does not have the appropriate uh, uh, level of care for the person who is uh, becoming a resident of that home. The supplementary question. Speaker, the minister has stated that long-term care could be part of the solution to what has been a decades-long challenge in acute care system. Part of the government's plan includes elimination of isolation rooms that have been set aside for COVID outbreaks at home or in home. Uh, there are currently a number of homes across the province in outbreak. Will this possibly policy not put these residents at risk? Is the uh, minister declaring victory over COVID at this time when uh, no one else is? Minister of Long-Term Care. Good, uh, a very, very good question from, uh, from the member, and I appreciate it. So what the, uh, the policy allows us to do, Mr. Speaker, is reflect on the fact that vaccinations have made such a difference in long-term care homes across the province of Ontario. Now, fully 81 percent of our residents uh, eligible residents have received a fourth dose, Mr. Speaker. Uh, what we are doing, of course, is there are currently 2,000 beds that have been set aside for isolation purposes. This policy will, will take about 1,000 of those beds and make them available for the acute care system leaving in place uh, over a thousand uh, beds for isolation purposes, uh, Mr. Speaker. Of course, homes still have to provide an emergency, uh, emergency plan, uh, Mr. Speaker. But to a specific question on, on, on outbreaks, there are still 167 homes down from 197 homes that are in outbreak, Mr. Speaker. But to, to put it into context, 34% of those uh, uh, are asymptomatic cases. 10% of the homes in outbreak have absolutely no resident cases, Mr. Speaker. And 60% of the homes that are considered in outbreak have between one and ten cases. So a lot of work has been done to ensure our seniors are safe in long-term care. Thank you. The member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. My constituent, Andrew, reached out to me saying, and I quote, I make decent money as an engineer, but there's no way I'll be able to afford a house in the next 10 years. It makes me want to leave. Many believe that zoning and supply are the issues, but demand is artificially generated by those who are rich enough to speculate and pay cash. Their greed will never run out. I end the quote. Speaker, every housing expert knows supply alone doesn't create the didn't create the housing crisis. Speculators with insider connections did. What is this government doing to stop the rampant speculation taking home ownership out of reach for young families and tenants? Associate Minister of Housing. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my honourable colleague for the question. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to housing, it, supply is absolutely the issue, Mr. Speaker, in this House, and I'm not sure why my colleagues in opposition continuously fight that. Mr. Speaker, as a result of inaction by the previous government, we are in a housing crisis in, in Ontario right now, and every single person in this province is feeling it, Mr. Speaker, which is why, under the leadership of this minister and this premier and this government, we are making a difference, Mr. Speaker. Last year alone, 100,000 starts started right here in this province mr speaker that's over 13,000 of those were rental units, Mr. Speaker. When we're talking about helping Ontarians, we're talking about housing across for every single province. Speaker, every single initiative that we've put forward, the opposition has voted against. They've let the people of this province down. We're going to fight for them for every single day to make sure life is more affordable Response. and everyone has a safe and loving home to go to. The supplementary question. Uh, speaker, thank you. And again to the Premier. Um, although my question wasn't answered, but I'm going to ask a new question. During a housing crisis and looming recession, this government is allowing a historic rent hike of 2.5 per cent. This government continues to allow a rent control loophole on new units. My constituent Terrence tells me this weekend how everyone he knows, including himself, is stuck living where they are now because to move, they'll be paying for more money for less housing. The prices are going up every month while rents are spiraling out of control. Speaker, while encampments grow in every Ontario city, why is this government worsening inflation by allowing a historic rent increase? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. No, Speaker, I, I was waiting for uh, this member to uh, ask a housing question because 
I wanted, from our government's perspective, to find out which MPP is here today. Was it the Toronto City Councillor who talked about supporting uh, more housing construction, or was it the Toronto City Councillor who once threatened to take this government to court about consulting on the building code and the recommendations regarding the Algoma Mall? Or was it, or was it, Speaker, through you, was it the councillor who once threatened to create her own red light system oh to stop development of housing in her riding? Oh over and over Order. again, Order. over and over again, Order. we've seen the Democrats not support when we want to strengthen penalties for bad landlords. We've seen New Democrats vote against increased support for tenants who were wrongfully evicted. Which New Democratic Party stands here today? The one that's going to support our government when we stand up for tenants, or the one that always blocks new construction? The next question. The next question. The member for Brampton East. Speaker, the auto industry helped make this province an economic and manufacturing powerhouse for decades. Yet, we saw the damage the previous Liberal government's policies did to this sector. With, we all remember the warning from the former CEO of Fiat Chrysler, Sergio Marchioni, who said that the Liberals' carbon tax policy risked toppling Ontario's competitive position in the auto industry. And today, we see that threat. Uh, that buy American policies like the U.S. EV tax credit have on Ontario's auto sector. My constituents are worried about the economic impacts this will have for Ontarians and the auto sector. Mr. Speaker, what is this government doing to protect the auto industry in Ontario? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. The Premier and our team spent considerable time with U.S. lawmakers, and we made a very solid case for what we call a buy North America stance. And this ended with a personal visit to Washington to visit with Canada's Ambassador uh, Kristen Hellman. Now we can proudly say that our team efforts paid off as the U.S. only EV program is now the North Amer American vehicle credit. This is yet another reason that automakers and those in the supply chain will continue to invest billions of dollars in Ontario's emerging world-class EV sector. By reversing the damage, the Liberals and the NDP caused over more than a decade, we've reduced the cost of doing business in Ontario by $7 billion annually. And, Speaker, it's Response. no wonder that we've already attracted $16 billion in EV investments and thousands of jobs over the last 20 months. Yeah, yeah. Supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, we remember when the previous Liberal government sent businesses running from Ontario with their costly policies. We can't afford to lose businesses once again. We need to increase production here in our province. We need to show the world that Ontario is open for business and that we are an auto industry leader once again. The communities of Oshawa, Windsor, Brampton, Oakville, Ingersoll, St. Thomas are all leaders when it comes to auto production. We know that we can compete with the rest of the world and succeed, but this is not the case with Liberal and NDP policies. My constituents want greater assurance that the Ontario's auto sector will be protected going forward and the new Buy America rules won't impact our EV sector. Speaker, can the minister outline how the government is ensuring the stability of the auto manufacturing industry in the province? Minister of Economic Development. We listened carefully to what the auto industry said they needed. After years of being strangled by the Liberals' anti-business policies and their hydro mess, our driving prosperity plan set out a 10-year vision for the future of mobility here in Ontario. We're already seeing the results, Speaker, of our auto plan. Ontario's automotive sector is in a stronger position today than it ever was under the previous government. $16 billion in transformative EV investments in 20 months did not 
happen by accident, Speaker. This is a new era for the province and our auto workers. We're bringing jobs back. We're bringing investments to communities the Liberals neglected, like Loyalist in the East, Cornwall, uh, Cobalt in the North, and Windsor in the Response. West. That's how we're driving prosperity. Ontario's auto is back. Here, 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 here. The next question, member for Kiwetanong. Um, speaker, uh, good morning. Um, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, uh, there are multiple Indigenous-led conservation projects in, uh, in Ontario. Two are in Kiwetnung, Kichinamek Subininua KI, and Grassy Narrows. Indigenous uh, protected and cons conserved areas are a necessary tool to protect the lands and the, the biodiversity of the North. But Ontario law does not recognize IPCAs as a protected area. Speaker, uh, why does Ontario have no process to enable Indigenous protected and conserved areas? The Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite uh, for that important question. Uh, Speaker, I think it's important uh, that each and every action that I take as Minister of Environment and that this government takes is done so with Indigenous communities. That's why uh, when I heard from Chief Duquet, uh, Doki First Nation, about important work we're doing on adjusting boundaries, we said yes. We said yes, as a government, we would work with them to adjust measures within the Provincial Parks and Conservation Reserve Act uh, to work listening with the First Nation community. When Murph Chichu spoke with us when I was up at Treaty 9 territory and asked about greater protections for French River, we said yes. These are all actions taken by Indigenous leaders, and each and every time we've listened, we've worked with them to explore the art of the possible. But it's important to note, Speaker, that this is led by and for Indigenous communities, and I'll always be willing to work alongside them Response. to achieve their goals and objectives. Thank you. The supplementary question. Uh, speaker, uh, back to the Premier. Kachinamek uh, Sabininuak have spent years safeguarding the watershed of their, in their treaty territories. While these lands and waters are protected under KI laws, Ontario must also reflect this in their laws to keep resource development in endangering the lands, the waters, the animals, and fish. This government must not resist the efforts of Indigenous people to protect these lands because this government, one of the ministers, have been trying to block and attempting the ICPAs. Will Ontario support KI's effort to protect their lands and waters? Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, this government will always work alongside Indigenous community to support expanding green space, protecting water, and protecting our endangered species in the north and throughout Ontario, Speaker. Um, I reflect again upon a work that we're doing uh, with Elliot Lake, uh, that member's colleague. Um, uh, we're doing important work there uh, to ensure a protection and oversight of a provincial park, and, and we're always willing to sit down with Indigenous leaders. Uh, Speaker, when it comes to protecting water and uh, working together, it is this government that, for the first time ever, launched the First Nations Advisory Circle through a mandate um, that I issued uh, the Ontario Clean Water Agency. Again, underscored by the principle, never about us, without us, we continue to work with Indigenous communities uh, to protect water in the north. And, and Speaker, it's this government that's led unprecedented plastic capture technology on our Great Lakes. Response. Speaker, it's this government uh, that is working at unlocking the potential that is the north. When I was on Treaty 9 territory, Chief Archibald welcomed the opportunity that EVs present to the north to unlock the potential of this province. And we understand... Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara West. Thank you very much, Speaker. Under the previous Liberal government, Ontarians experienced energy insecurity like they had never seen before. Because of the Liberals' reckless energy policies, there were families that had to choose between heating or eating. Businesses left Ontario because we were deemed to not be competitive and too costly of a jurisdiction. 
Worst of all, we saw the opposition publicly muse about getting rid of our nuclear capabilities altogether. Speaker, let me be clear. We can never allow our energy system to be compromised at the expense of all Ontarians. Ontario's nuclear energy sector provides reliable and environmentally sound energy for our entire province. The continued use of nuclear energy in Ontario will displace approximately 80 million tonnes per year of carbon dioxide. Speaker, could the Minister of Energy please explain how our government is enhancing our energy strength by partnering with nu the nuclear sector and ensuring that the technological advancements that Ontario is pioneering are first and foremost? And the Minister of Energy to reply. Thanks very much, Speaker. Thanks to the member opposite for the question. That's exactly why our government is committed to a reliable, affordable, sustainable, and clean energy sector. And that's why we're leveraging small modular reactors and our first mover status that we have so that we can untap the benefits to our economy in Ontario, in Canada, and indeed around the world. This past spring, we announced our vision to partner with other provinces, New Brunswick, Alberta, Saskatchewan, for the deployment of small modular reactors across the country. And we're also creating new opportunities to export Ontario's goods, our technology and our expertise to North America and around the world, especially in Eastern Europe. Last week, I joined OPG in one of the largest electrical uh, utilities in the United States, Tennessee Valley Authority, the TVA, to announce a collaboration that's going to allow TVE to replicate what we're doing with small modular reactors here in Response. Ontario, a first grid-scale SMR, and that's why we're going to continue to unlock the potentials of SMR for our environment and our economy, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Supplementary question. Thank you very much, Speaker. And when we take a global look at energy markets, we see that Ontario's energy leadership is needed now more than ever. Russia's unprovoked and illegal attack on Ukraine, along with the growing instability in Asia as the Chinese Communist regime attempts to destabilize that region, has left our global partners seeking a strong, stable, reliable source of energy. And Ontario can step up and show leadership and demonstrate that we are a trusted, capable, stable <coughs> worldwide nuclear leader. Ontario's nuclear ingenuity and know-how is unmatched, and our record of success is unparalleled. We just need a government that is willing to support this vital, vital industry. Speaker, can the Minister of Energy explain how our government will advance this nuclear technology knowledge and provide leadership to other jurisdictions? What is the government doing when it comes to showing the world that Ontario is the leader when it comes to small modular reactor technology? Minister of Energy. Thanks very much. Thanks, Speaker. Ontario has a proud history and a long one as a trusted leader in nuclear expertise internationally. And as new nuclear technologies such as small modular reactors become more mature and commercially viable, we need to be ready to leverage our domestic supply chain. 76,000 workers in Ontario, experienced nuclear operators, to make the most of this opportunity. We also need to be ready for an increased demand for clean, reliable and affordable electricity here in Ontario, whether it's the electrification of our transportation sector, powering new electric vehicles for EVs or making green steel with electric arc furnaces. Our economy is growing and it's electrifying. Nuclear power is going to continue to be a key part of Ontario's clean electricity grid, Mr. Speaker. As we move towards a clean energy future, it's clear that there is no path Spots. forward without nuclear energy to get us to net zero. The next question, the member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. Denise, a 31-year-old Toronto woman, is in need of a home that can accommodate her wheelchair and is free of chemicals and strong smells because she has multiple chemical sensitivities. However, Denise can't afford any apartment that meets these criteria because she is on ODSP. Unable to afford housing that can accommodate her disabilities, Denise has applied for medical assistance in dying. Speaker, it is absolutely horrifying that anyone in Ontario should be forced to choose death because they can't afford to live. Will the Premier commit to doubling Ontario Works and ODSP immediately so that everyone in Ontario can afford to live? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite. You know, my heart goes out to anyone facing difficulty uh, in their lives, such as the individual you mentioned, and uh, that is exactly why our government has increased the ODSP rates to a, a really decades-long uh, largest increase.
in, in, this, uh, in this program. This is historic. And it's not the only thing that we use to support people in their time of need. There are those who cannot work, and we support them through ODSP, through the, the variety of social assistance programs, the, the lift uh, tax credit, the, the care tax credit, uh, the, the, the uh, dental benefits for uh, elderly low-income seniors. We're continuing to allow discretionary benefits to be used for people in unusual circumstances. And, and we're Order. working with our municipalities in that shared vision of how do we improve the lives of people who aren't Response. able to work, while creating the, the training programs Order. and the job readiness programs for those who can work. And we'll continue to do that important work. Thank you. The supplementary. An extra $50 a month isn't going to get anyone housing in this market, Speaker. Denise is not alone. Tracy Thompson, who contracted long COVID in March 2020, has recently applied for medical assistance and dying as well. Tracy, who has not even been able to get ODSP because long COVID is not recognized by the program, has been clear that her application is exclusively a financial consideration. She wants to live, but she can't afford to. Speaker, we have reached a point in Ontario where people are being forced to choose between a quick death before the money runs out and a long, painful, slow death without financial support. So why is the Premier not taking action to address poverty? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. Once again, you know, my heart goes out to anyone who's in that situation. And that's why we're working Order. across across government to make sure that we put in the supports needed for people in these situations. And it's exactly why anyone in this situation should also be seeking um, mental health supports. And I'm very pleased to say that our, my, the Associate Minister Order. of Mental Health and Addiction is, is doing just that to create the programs necessary. This is something they're also working with the federal government to make sure that they bring forth uh, and fulfill their commitment to the Canadian disability benefit and also the, the programs for the supports through the federal government, but also our municipalities. And understanding that partnership is, is so important whether it's improving access to housing uh, across ministry, whether it's the Ministry of, of Health creating uh, programs to support people in their time of need. This is a multi-ministry effort. It is across municipal governments. It is across the uh, layers Response. of government, including the federal government. And we'll continue to work for solutions. This is an important area, uh, allowing people to get the support that they need when they need it. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, to the Finance Minister. Uh, speaker, with the cost of living rising throughout the province, working people in Ontario and in my riding are being impacted by what feels like increasing prices on all day-to-day -day essentials. While the GTA is home to many hardworking Ontarians, it is also one of the most expensive regions to live in Canada. Food insecurity affects almost one in five Toronto households. Uh, recently, the U University of Toronto released a report that shows that nearly 16% of Canadians live with food insecurity. As families' basic needs continue to increase, we know that many families will have challenges, especially with a liberal carbon tax that raises the cost of everything. Speaker, can the Minister of Finance share what our government is doing to provide financial re relief for the people of my riding and for all hardworking Ontarians? Thank you. The Minister of Finance. Well, thank you to the member uh, from Brampton North for that uh, very uh, good question, and thank you, Speaker. You know, Russia's war in the Ukraine, uh, tension in Asia, inflation that we haven't seen in four decades are driving up global prices, Mr. Speaker. But this government will always be there for the people of Ontario in these uncertain times. That is why our government raised the minimum wage and we'll raise it again in October to $15.50 an hour. That is why we eliminated the need for license plate stickers and renewal fee fees, saving drivers up to $120 per year. Mr. Speaker, that's why we're proposing the enhanced lift tax credit, providing additional relief for those making less than $50,000 a year. Speaker, with this change, 1.1 million, million low-income workers would see an additional $300 on average in tax Once relief in 2022. The best way to support workers and families is to put more money back into their pockets, Mr. Speaker, and that's exactly what this government is doing. The supplementary question. 
Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the Minister of Finance for the answer to that question. I, uh, I would note as having uh, served in his office prior and had to answer a lot of his tough questions, I'm happy that he's here uh, answering mine. Uh, now, now, Mr. Speaker, many Ontarians, including in my riding of Brampton North, are concerned about the cost of gas, which uh, the NDP would like us to raise on hardworking Ontarians, Mr. Speaker. Now, for far too long, we had a Liberal government, supported by the NDP, that continued to impose new tax on new tax, increasing the financial burdens on hardworking Ontario families. Because of their reckless policies, we saw how they made life more unaffordable for not only my constituents, Mr. Speaker, but for all Ontarians. They brought in, it is shameful, they brought in a devastating carbon tax that raises the cost of everything. They implemented gas tax hikes with the HST. They made life less affordable for all Ontarians. Question. During the last provincial election, there was even a candidate, Mr. Speaker, if you can believe, who was a former MPP, uh, who called high gas prices a blessing in disguise. Speaker, wow. Speaker, can the minister please tell us how our government is Thank you. Thank you very much. Minister of Finance, to apply. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I really am pleased by the member opposite's enthusiasm uh, on this issue to uh, ask the Minister of Finance these questions. But let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, for families trying to make ends meet, high gas prices are never a blessing in disguise. This government un understands that it is high gas prices are a financial burden on many Ontarians, taking hard-earned money out of their pockets for families, for workers and for seniors. That's why this government is focused on keeping costs down. That's why this government eliminated the Liberals' cap-and-trade tax scheme. This government temporarily cut the gas tax by 5.7 cents per litre through our relief at the Pumps Act. Mr. Speaker, the facts speak for themselves. According to Statistics Canada, the price of gas fell furthest in Ontario because of our gas tax. The opposition voted against, Mr. Speaker. This government will always fight. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. This House stands in recess until 1 p.m.